Hello, everybody. Matt McCarthy. Uh, hi, everybody. I'll start again because we're not sure if we were recording just then, but Matt McCarthy here with our for Rugby Wrap-Up with our first ever webcast slash YouTube Live slash Google Hangout slash phone call, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and what better way to do it than with a very large man who has had a lot of caps with Team USA, uh, USA Rugby's Eagles, that is, and he's a three-time World Cupper, Mr. Tony Ridnell. Tony, are you there? I am indeed. Thank you. Uh, I think after Dan Payne set the example the other day on that uh, Facebook live chat, I think we're, 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 uh, we're lagging behind, but this will be a good chat. Yeah, Looking fa forward to it. Facebook Live is so 2016. <laughs> exactly. You know? Exactly. Uh, so, Tony, why the hell are you on a rugby wrap up uh, podcast, webcast, slash Google Hangouts, like you do live cast? Well, it's, it's a good question. You know, the, the, what I've been doing is a, is a summary of about a year and a half of work after the, uh, the, the, what I call it, debacle against South Africa in the World Cup when I was. Standing there, having been hosted by AIG, had a great day. Uh, you know, and we go out, and, and I'm with all these South African businessmen, and, and and 50 points comes up from them in the second half, and inevitably having to answer the question, you know, when are you guys in the States going to get it together? When is the sleeping giant going to awake? And something happened to me that day, Matt. I was wearing all red, white, and blue, and and, and I was pretty excited because I thought we were going to really compete in that game, and, and I was just – I was really disappointed at 64 to nothing. And I turned around and I saw some of our board members, you know, in their little VIP thing, you know, taking pictures with the South African models right after the game, you know, and I just was pissed, man. I mean, I, you know, I, I played on this team 20, 25 years ago. And quite frankly, it's important to me that we win, you know, at the, at the men's level, at the women's level, it, it's, and as Brett, Brett Gosper said at the world rugby conference, uh, we, a national team's success is the single most uh, effective way to grow a sport in your country and to grow rugby in your country, which is an interesting philosophy, right? So it's part of what we, we probably should do is, is get the game out in front of people, but we've, we've got to provide a competitive national team. So that was my drive early on. And uh, I called up a guy that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. He was a, a, one, of the, one of the Rugby World Cup captains. And I said, hey, what's going on here? And, and uh, you know, I, I saw Nigel's, uh, Nigel Melville's interview after the match and Mike Tolkien's. And Nigel said, you know, disappointing result, but we're happy with our progress. We're happy with the journey we're on. And uh, this was after found, the loss to South Africa. Yes, sir. And, and, and what I found out over the course of last year is we really don't we're not on a journey. We haven't been on a journey. And we've been uh, we've been listening to some people who have been telling us things that just aren't happening. Uh, and I'm delighted to, to that the Dan is Dan Payne is the CEO. Absolutely delighted. But but what I want to talk to you about is us providing support at the highest level for him. All right. But before we do that, I yes, want sir. to um, go into your bio and the reason why um, you're on here. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Bronxville, New York kid, which is the right. basically the Bronx, ladies and gentlemen. And you uh, spent some time in Sydney, Australia. Correct. I did. Yes, indeed. And. Yep. Uh, I Played rugby when I was 10, 10 years old, 10 to 13. So, you know, experienced the uh, the, the oranges at halftime and, and all that stuff as a kid. It was great. <laughs> the, oh, they did the orange slices in Australia? Orange slices at halftime, absolutely. My mom was my mom was uh, was was fantastic. So uh, you're a tall man. How tall are you? I am. I'm uh, six. Well, I was six foot six. The doctor's telling me I'm six foot five and a half now. So at age 56, the, the, the compression might be happening. So I would imagine um, they put you at lock right away. Yeah, pretty much. You know, I always tried to sneak out of there, and play six, seven, or eight as much as I could. But uh, but yeah, I started off as a lock for sure. So the ears are somewhat intact. Yeah, no, they're still intact. I I, I was born with some pretty big ears. My my, uh, I told no, my son, no, no. I told my, I told my son he's got two things for me: his big ears and a small butt. You know, that's that's <laughs> everything else is from his mom. So. Yeah, no, I, I, my ears are okay. Um, it's just what's between them that might be the problem. All right, let's get inside that head. Yes, so sir. you got um, you got an interesting background. You were a West Point graduate. Yes, you sir. were the uh, you were a field artillery battery commander in the army. Yes. Is that accurate? Yep. And yes. then you uh, you went on to an Eagles career. How many caps? 
I had 14 caps. I played over 50 games for the Eagles. I, I was a, uh, I was a, I was a Wednesday guy uh, often, but uh, and then I had a really nice run in '90 and '91 before the World Cup, and played in every game leading up to the World Cup in '91, and that was just a great experience. And then um, into business, into chemical engineering. Well, not chemical engineering. We're in the chemical trading and distribution business, and I founded my company in 1994. Are you are you parsing words with me right now, Tony? <laughs> no, I'm a little chemical engineer. I get called from my guys at, at work to you're no chemical engineer. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, we're in the trading and distribution business. So I founded the company in 1994. I'm the CEO. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I actually promoted, uh, uh, I created a president job so that it would allow me a little more freedom uh, personally and professionally. Um, but it's given me some time and perspective, you know, my rugby experience and my work experience as a CEO and on several boards has caused me to, you know, look at our rugby in America at a slightly different level than a lot of people have. Well, certainly because your your blog is is looked at by a bunch of people. I know I read it, and um, yep. you you know the one thing about it, you talk about chemical your chemical business and rugby on your blog, and <laughs> oddly you've managed to mesh the two in a way because you're doing a comparative study or a, a, a comparison or an analysis rather of the organization USA Rugby, and comparing it to how a corporation such as yours is run and how the plan is put forth and all that. And you're saying basically it's been a, a Mickey Mouse organization. It's been, to, yeah, it's been, you know, I, I think we could see that. I mean, the results show it. And again, I want to, I want to say something, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, about the board and Congress and how that is all related. Um, anything I say today has nothing to do with any personal feelings I have about anyone or, you know, whether people are nice guys or whether they're smart guys or successful guys, I'm just going to talk about the collective and individual results from what we've seen from our board of directors. So have, have you at any point been on the board of directors? I should have done my homework on it. I haven't. No, I was, I was nominated this year. Um, I, I did not get selected. Dean Barrett, the uh, former VP of uh, in marketing at McDonald's was selected. Apparently he's, the Congress members have told me he's, he is a very plugged in business person, which, which I appreciate. One of the things I'm going to talk about is the absolute requirement to have a rug, a, people with rugby experience on this board. Not everyone, but uh, on the board currently as it sits, and we're jumping ahead, ahead you know, really the, 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 the maximum level of play and administration from what I can tell of our board members is club rugby. Um, and there's just something about our sport that's globe, you know, that's so global about it. One of the reasons I, I, I talk about the international aspect is because I think the international aspect is what makes the game so unique. The fact that, you know, uh, uh, Brad Young can take his Kent women's crusaders under 17 team to, uh, I think they went to New Zealand this year. You know, what an unbelievable opportunity for a group of young girls to be sure. able to travel playing a sport in another country. I mean, that, that is what, that's why rugby is beautiful to me. It's the culture and the community. Uh, and I, I just want, I want us in America. I I'm just personally tired of the, when is the giant going to wake up? And I've done a lot of work looking at it and I'd like to tell you about it a little bit. All right. So let's, um, let's, let's get this, let's bang this out because you know, yeah. our, our uh, contemporaries have the attention span of gnats when right, it comes exactly. to the internet, right. And exactly. trying to figure out the technology to watch us exactly. like we were doing, we, we folks, we were splitting our heads uh, collectively here, <laughs> trying to figure this out. So, um, let, let's 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 back it up a bit. Okay, so the governing body of amateur rugby in the United States is USA Rugby, That's and correct. they're important for a, a number of reasons. But particularly if you are a professional setup, you want the sanctioning slash blessing correct. of USA Rugby because that's the only way a player that wants to represent the nation can partake in your organization, your league, or your event, right? Correct. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So that body, the, the USA Rugby, has a board of directors that That's select correct. the operating officers or the CEO, so to speak, and then maybe That's some correct. staff members or decide what he can hire for USA Rugby, correct? That's correct, yep. Currently, Dan Payne is the CEO. 
He has replaced Nigel Melville, who went back to England to uh, take on the director of rugby job for the RFU. Right, right so far. Big job, absolutely. Okay, so you've got the board of directors, but you also have a Congress for yes. USA Rugby. And so let me let, let me let me if I may, I'll just I'll just do a little bit of where I'm I'm coming from. You know, as a player, you're evaluated and held to account by your coach, right? Coaches hold players to account. Uh, in this, in some sort of structure, a general manager would hold a coach to account. By the same structure, a, a CEO or an owner would hold the general manager to account. We've seen that. Uh, who holds the CEO account to account? Well, that is the board's job. The board's job is to hold the CEO to account. It's very clear. It's in the bylaws of USA Rugby and pretty much any other business. And who's going to hold the board to account? Yeah. Right? So we've got a whole spectrum of really not the greatest accountability, particularly at the higher levels regarding some financial decisions, the decision to sanction pro, all in the absence of a strategic plan. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk about a duty of care, a level of responsibility, a, letter, a level of complacency, a level of, well, we're just letting Nigel do it, uh, which is which was a, the ruling sort of ethos of the board when, when Nigel was here, as far as I could tell, based on personal conversations with board members. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is just the possibility of rugby in America being world class from top to bottom, world class. I think we have a CEO now that could show us this direction. His energy, his passion, absolutely off the charts. The question and answer session the other day, although it was slightly, uh, he picked a few too many softball questions, but I understand why. But just that, that method of being transparent is something new that we're gonna see in the American rugby community. And I think that happens has to happen at all levels particularly uh, at the board level and at the highest level so that we can, so that people can buy into what the leaders of American rugby are talking about. So I've, I, I talked about accountability a little bit, who holds people to account. Uh, Congress, uh, the Congress is, holds the board to account or, or tries to. But in, in the United States, we don't have any rugby media, okay? Hey, 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 like hey, say, hey, hey. Like say, hey. Like to, hold on, I'd like to say, I'd like to say we don't have any mainstream whoa. rugby media. We don't whoa, have whoa. We don't have the Seattle Times covering. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to just say you guys are doing a great job. Absolutely, Thank you're, you. you're the rep. You know, as I as I called a few people about getting onto a cast, the reputation of rugby wrap up is that you guys are trying to take it to a new level, really professionalize some media coverage of rugby in the United States, which is great. Traditionally in any business or any other major sporting country, the media would be the one that holds a board or a CEO to account. You know, yeah. what are the decisions? Why are we making the decision to sanction pro? What is RIM? And the newspapers would be calling for, we want to know what RIM is. Why are we selling equity to overseas partners? Uh, why does USA Rugby only get a license fee from RIM? Uh, who are the investors? You know, just to sort of all these questions that in an era in an era of transparency, we should we should be hearing more of for sure. So, so my, for the my, folks my, at home, for the folks at home that don't know, Pro is profession the pro, profession the professional rugby organization, PRO Rugby. I think they ought to just call it the PRO, like the NFL, the PRO. Sure. All right, let's eliminate that confusion. And RIM is Rugby International Marketing, which is now the for-profit entity partnering with USA Rugby. Up until this point of RIM being formed, USA Rugby was operating exclusively as a non-profit organization. That's correct. Right? That's correct. That's so they needed to figure out a way to make some money. But what you're saying here is this, this uh, the RIM situation is not exactly optimal. Well, we don't know much about it, right? So what I heard, you know, uh, what I heard Dan talking about uh, on Friday in his Q&A was that we're going to have a $1 million budget shortfall this year, revenue shortfall. He talked about Brexit being a possible cause of that and currency exchanges. But I think the majority of that is going to be the BLK sponsorship is going to go away because of their bankruptcy, the, the uh, apparel company. Oof. And then uh, because of our underperforming in the Olympics, I believe our USOC grant is reduced and I, and I believe our world rugby grant is reduced. So uh, Dan talked about a million dollar shortfall. A couple of people I've talked to think it might be more than that. 
And so when I'm looking at the growth of rugby in America, and I personally know from my trip to the UK over New Year's that there are people just waiting to pour money into this country, whether it's a Pro 12 expansion, Super Rugby, uh, clubs, academies. There's, there's a lot of money ready to come in this country, pretty much all being withheld until our administration can get their act together. And I just like to well, talk well, about well, well, what monies are you talking about? Well, you know, there, there, there's uh, there's bids for the Pro 12 coming here uh, for sure. Oh, but wait uh, a minute. Wait a minute. You've got <laughs> yes. a, an exclusive sanction yes. deal with Pro right. Rugby the with the PRO trademark. Right. Well, this uh, is this is this is one of the things I want to talk about. And this is what the board's performance. So when Doug Schoeninger showed up two years ago and said, here I am, I've got $30 million and I want to start a professional rugby league in the United States. Uh, he got his sanction. And I went to a board member's house to discuss RIM and PRO with that board member. And I asked the board member, so what was the sanctioning process? And he told me, he said, uh, well, Nigel brought this uh, possibility to the board, Doug Schoeninger's uh, uh, proposal. He's got $30 million. Uh, he was the first one that came to the table with a professional rugby proposal. And quite frankly, we didn't do much diligence. We didn't check his financials. Uh, and we gave him the sanction. And because he was the first one, this is a board member talking to me, because Doug was the first one to show up, the board felt that uh, they did not have the right or the desire to sort of talk about what was going to happen behind the scenes? How are how are players going to get paid? How are players going to get released from the from their legacy clubs, like an Ombak or a Seattle or a New York Athletic Club, and all of this stuff that you know maybe it wouldn't have it wouldn't have it wouldn't have changed the sanction, but at least we would know what to expect. So the first thing that happened was you know the legacy clubs were torn apart because no one told them they were going to need to give up players to this professional rugby league. So it kind of blew but up. I think, the come on, it, but if but if you're not seeing that, then you're. We, we, what are you living in a cave? You don't think that the players are going to go to the the pro setup? I mean, I've I've well, I've had this conversation with folks before, and about clubs getting ticked off about their players going on to pro rugby and decimating a club. But I played for the New York Rugby Club for years. If we had a guy going to the Eagles or we had a guy going to pro rugby, we'd be doing cartwheels. Absolutely. We should, but like you know, a club like the Seattle Saracens, San Francisco Golden Gate, I think they lost ten or twelve players each. So, so what? What, the, what the is the goal the, of the club then, if they don't the, want their players to go on to pro contracts? Well, Matt, this is my point. Okay, you're you're kind of playing right into my point here. Damn. So we've got this strategic we've got this strategic plan that's coming out, right? And I I, I want to I just want to say that you know I'm very glad that this strategic plan's coming out. I've been calling for it. Any business that takes themselves seriously operates on a strategic plan. And if I'm the chairman of the board of USA Rugby, I'm the new chairman of the board, I come in, the first thing I'm going to ask is, what's our plan? Show me our plan and show me our results against that plan. The fact that our board has not enforced what is under the bylaws, the first thing of the, the authority and power of a board member, if I may read it, is to formulate in consultation with management and monitor the implementation of the implementation of the strategic plan of the corporation. And the fact that we have not had a strategic plan for 10 years or our board and the chairman of the board has not called for this plan for 10 years is why we are talking about this, why we have not progressed as a rugby playing nation on and off the field. We absolutely have growth. There is growth in numbers, but let's face it, that's not USA Rugby's uh, uh, accomplishment. That's the accomplishment of guys like you and Bill Eversee and Gary Hine and, and, and Heather Harley, all these people coming together, uh, uh, creating Michelle Connor and from my office is a, is a youth president. Now that's where it's just all the energy of the people getting around in the game. It's, it, it's not, it has been, it's been facilitated by USA rugby, but the growth is due to the people. No question, the community of rugby in this country, and and I don't think anyone should take credit for for the growth of rugby, other than the people that are making it happen on the ground. All right. So what do you say? So, what do you say to those that would say, okay, well now we have new faces, we have yes. uh, 
Nigel Melville uh, is is gone. He's on the other side of the pond. You have yes. um, a new board of a new chairman of the board, Will Chang. What do you say to people yes. that say, okay, and, and you have Dan Payne, who we we both are in in agreement with saluting him for coming on and doing that transparency thing, or you know, as much as. But needs tremendous support. He's going to need tremendous support, and it's my assessment that based on the results of this board collectively, and again, this is nothing personal, but the fact that this board sanctioned pro rugby with literally no background check, due diligence, anything, is the reason that we're in this problem today. Well, how, how do you know that, though? Just I'm playing the devil's advocate here. How do I know the due diligence was, didn't get done? There was like no – there was a I was, in the, I was in the living room of a USA Rugby board member, and he told me the whole story. And, I, you know, I, I, this was about six months ago. I didn't want to blog about it then because I didn't think – you know, I just – it wasn't it, – it, I knew it was crucial and critical, but – here we are today, you know, coming into January, coming into 2017, where uh, we're actually going to we're going to suffer for the next 18 to 24 months because of this pro rugby debacle. So can you I, can you tell us? I got to ask. Can you tell us who the board member was? I'd rather not. You know, I'd rather not. Again, I don't want to make this is not personal. This is a collective. This is a this is a, a conglomeration of the results or lack thereof of our board who who sanctioned pro rugby and then spent two years creating this for-profit arm called RIM, all without an overarching plan. And I just can't imagine my business, I, I just can't imagine in my business us not having a plan and making multi, and having my board involved in multi-million dollar decisions without a plan. That's right. just- let's, it, let's, it, let's address those decisions about RIM and yes. the- I know that because I've read I've read your stuff and I've I've stayed on top of your stuff and I Thank and you. I like it, um, but tell people that don't know briefly uh, about some of the deals that Rims made that you don't find particularly smart. Well, it, you know, again, the lack of transparency and the lack of any any information on what Rim is, who they are, who they're talking to is is frustrating, and I'm pretty psyched for the for the Dan Payne era, you know, of transparency. Uh, but we've got to get that we've got to get that same level of transparency and networking and going out and aggressively pushing the American rugby agenda to be world class. Uh, we're going to need a world class board. And from my assessment is having been involved in the nomination process and looking at the results, uh, we need we need to take a look at this board. We need to do a hyper order audit of each individual. And the collective, and 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 it's Congress's responsibility to do that. I don't think I asked your question. Answer your question there. If you'd answer, ask it again, I'd be glad to. Well, I just the specific deals that Rim has made. Okay, right, right, right. So, 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 um, so Rim apparently is pay, it pays yearly a uh, uh, a licensing fee to USA Rugby. On the website, it indicates that for the next three years, it's somewhere between one point two. And 1.8 million dollars. I think next year is 1.8 million. So is that a minimum? Uh, Can it? Will it go up? Are there bumps as they make money, or is that just? I don't sick? know the answer to that. I I don't know the answer to that because there's just not that much information out. And as a member of USA Rugby, I'd like to know that because what I heard from Dan Payne was there's a million dollar revenue shortfall. And it and what I heard from Dan was the only way we're gonna we're, we're gonna overcome that is we're gonna have to grow our membership organically. And he talked about thirty thousand new yeah. rugby people Growing members twenty five percent in the next years. couple of years. Yeah, which is you know that's gonna you know that's gonna take some execution as well. And hopefully that's incorporated in the strategic plan. How are we gonna execute bringing in thirty thousand people? And then three years from now, hopefully we evaluate: did we bring in thirty thousand people? Um, but in this case, you know, uh, to raise money, RIM is selling equity now Now, in itself. Um, USA Rugby apparently will always be the major owner of RIM, the majority owner. But from what I know, we, we've sold 10% to uh, Chime or CSM, which is, which is a super rugby sports agency, uh, sports enter rugby entertainment agency. And how will uh, that conflict? Called, I got to interrupt you there. How will that? How will that conflict with 
the legacy agency, who is the backbone of the All Blacks and Ireland coming to Chicago. Right. You know, I, I can't answer that. I'd, I'd love to hear the answer to that, too. There, you know, there's there, there's again, a lot of people are working in silos, Matt. Right. You've got people that are focused on youth. You've got people that are focused on high performance. You've got people that are focused on women and what, whatever it might be, whatever their facets are, five to 12 year olds, high school, college. You know, everyone's got their own thing. My own thing is this leadership accountability uh, uh, question. And I'm personally, with, with my business experience and my rugby experience, I know we can do better. I absolutely know we can do better. You know, so it's interesting, you, interesting you bring up silos because I know that you have pigs and chickens and horses and cats and, <laughs> yeah. and, yeah, and peacocks, right? So, yes, we do. Yes, all right. we do. All right. So I don't want to, I don't want to get you off track. But, um, no problem. So the account accountability thing. I'm the, I'm the eternal optimist, and right. I agree with you about the previous years here have been really uh, hidden, obs very obscure. But we have it's, it's been frustrating. It's been frustrating. But we have Absolutely. the internet now. We have we have big time corporations looking at rugby. We have NBC Absolutely. involved. We've got. You know, you've got AIG with the All Blacks, and it's it yep. is the American Insurance Group, right? American. Absolutely. Right. Uh, you've you've got different corporations that are now looking at this. Penn Mutual here in the East Coast for the CRC Sevens, super, super and Rhino smart. Rugby. You know, you, you, it's starting to grow. It's starting, to, and, and that's got to that's got to mean transparency. Well, I mean, it's just the the, the tipping point is here. Uh, there's no doubt. There is money dying to be poured into this country, rugby both internally and from overseas, no question. And, and, and from my trip overseas, uh, there is very little confidence in the administration of our union uh, from, from, from the legacy. There is excitement about Dan Payne, but I, you know, let, I don't think that strategic plan is going to have any business plan behind it. So RIM, RIM, is our, our, RIM is our sole major money source that does not involve sticking your hand out and saying, please donate to the USA Rugby Trust. And Payne said it the, uh, the other day on multiple occasions. Or pay your dues. We're going to lean on the membership. We're going to lean on the membership. We're going to continue to lean on the membership. And I'm trying to understand, you know, we're just going back to the well and we've, cre you know, of the, going back to the membership. And yet we've got this entity rim that, from what we can tell is they've raised money by selling equity. So there's not really been any value added. And what I hear, what I hear from, from Payne on Friday is that we got a million dollar budgetary shortfall in the next 18 to 24 months are going to be brutal. All right. And I, um, I just don't think we should accept. I just don't think we should accept that. I, I think we should get some world-class players on our board to support a future world-class CEO and Dan Payne. I don't think our board is ready at this time to keep up with the passion and the energy and the drive of what's going to happen rugby in America. All right. So Tony, two things. First of all, if you can scoot a little bit closer, cause uh, you're getting a little yes, fuzzy sir. off camera there. I think you, yes, your sir. camera's not picking up with you. Uh, you're pixelating a little bit, but well, that's okay. fine because we can still see you right through that. We can see that passion. So perfect world, perfect case yes. scenario. What is your rendition of the board of directors rim and USA Rugby. Okay, so 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 USA Rugby owns RIM. There's apparently three board of directors that share common seats at USA Rugby and at RIM. I believe that that could create a tremendous uh, conflict of interest, myself, um, and I think I think that we have I think we have uh, board members that may know some finance, they may know certain parts of business, but I think that we don't have anyone there in on that board that could put together the rugby component and the business component at the same time. And I will tell you this, you know, when I was over in the UK, Rory Underwood has, has been a, uh, you know, obviously the England wing, he was a jet pilot, he's not a businessman, but he's been on the, the Leicester Board of Directors for nine years. We had a great conversation about the role of, of a board member and how important in the unique game of rugby that that there are board members that have a very high level of rugby experience internationally, domestically, to be able to put together some of the pieces that if you don't have that experience, you wouldn't know. 
And it's not that it's not that anyone's making bad decisions. Everyone's making decisions based on what they know. I just think we just don't have the experience level. Because if we did at this board, they would have looked at that pro rugby model. They would have asked some questions and said, you know, how are you going to take your players? How are we going to guarantee payments? Where are you going to play? What, you know, what cities are you going to play in? And uh, that could have, that should have and could have been incorporated in a plan. And as Dan Payne issues this new plan, he's got a couple of sacred cows in there. Pro rugby has got to be included in there as a top tier competition in the strategic plan because it's there now. But we all know that it's not going to be there in two years. So I think we're... Well, we don't know that, though. We don't well, know that because what, what, what seems to be going on is with only a three-year exclusive sanctioning deal, Yes, which is again important because if you have, if you're not sanctioned by USA Rugby, the players can't play for the nation's team. So the best players for rugby in the United States right now happen to be in the Eagle Pool, the na the yes. nation's team. Yes. So, so yep. if you want a professional league here, you want access to those players. You're not going to have access to those players if you don't have sanctioning from USA Rugby, and they signed a three-year deal. So that three-year deal, if I'm a businessman, mm -hmm. is short. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Schoeninger requested another year for the runway a couple of weeks ago. And Payne apparently said, look, you know, get your, get it together, pay your bills and we can talk about it. But I, I, you know, quite frankly, talking about pro is pretty frustrating because the fact of the matter is the character of the individual who owns pro rugby has been shown to be not of the level that 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 I would like in our game in this country. Uh, very little regard for the community or culture of the game. Uh, very little regard for the international aspect of the game. Uh, yeah, when he was on, when Schoeninger was on the, the stage with uh, the NFL international director and Brett Gosper, the CEO of World Rugby, you know, literally sort of arguing about how America has unique values, unique rugby values, and we're we're going to kind of change the way we market the game and play the game. And I'm listening to that just. In, in sheer amazement that 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 Doug was our our representative on the world rugby stage and then a month later he shuts down his league it's just an absolute embarrassment and again i just want to say that the fact that our board allowed this sanctioning to happen without questioning is 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 nothing short of negligent and and we as a rugby playing nation are going to be are going to suffer because of this pro debacle for the next 2 years all right take out the Tony Ridnell crystal ball and tell me what's going to happen with the pro rugby USA rugby situation. Oh my gosh. Well, it's, it's, it, it certainly is a standoff. Right. Um, and, and I, I'm, I don't have access. I haven't seen the contract, you know, again, all I'm doing is talking to people. Um, I think, uh, I think what will happen is, uh, uh, over the course of the next couple of months, they're going to be, numerous grievances filed against the league and the owner and i think uh any stand that he has about loss of sanctioning is going to be null and void just because he has not fulfilled his uh, his contractual obligations to suppliers vendors players and things like that my, my assessment is we need to get this done as soon as possible and we need to we need to be able to incorporate our strategic plan look at our top 10 mar top tier markets create a top tier playing competition uh, create semi-professionalism like many of the guys are doing. Some of the boys down in Texas, what they're doing in Seattle, San Francisco, Golden Gate. I'm back. Starting to pay players, create your own community of professionalism. And that's so happening. use the club use the club level as a farm system. I would love to, I would love to see that. But again, Matt, it all this all needs to happen within the context of a plan. How could you make a decision about starting a pro league or allowing a pro league if we didn't? think about how that would ratchet through to the Eagles or how college players moving up can, 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 can use the pro rugby as a pathway, just kind of showing up and throwing a league together. And with no regard for the current community, I think was a, a travesty, absolute travesty. It, 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 it created a lot of bad blood. It's still, there's still a lot of bad blood. And the but fact I'll, that I'll tell you what though, I'll tell you what though, a show of hands, um, us, Every single person that's been involved in the pro rugby setup, whether they regret that 
first year happening. Right. Be interesting to see whose hands went up and whose didn't. Well, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, because it happened. We, you know, right. Oh, absolutely. No, and, and, and we need a professional league in the United States. There is no question. And quite frankly, I was very positive. I wrote on my blog, you know, that, that first weekend, I couldn't believe that Steve Lewis got that, got that, uh, got that league off the ground. An absolutely incredible uh, effort on people to, to get every game off on time. Uh, uh, but the fact of the matter is that it's just a non-starter. This, this fellow not paying his bills, it's a non-starter, and we need to, we need to go. Absolutely well, I, a non-starter I, I, for me. Okay, so let me put it to you this way. This is going to be our, our uh, segue out. Yes. Um, first situation, you are Doug Schoeninger, businessman. What do you do? What are you looking for? And I, and I'm, and I mean you right are now. him, okay? And then you're Dan Payne. What do you do? Well, he, um, you know, I, did, I didn't want to get down the, this pro rugby rabbit hole because I really, you know, I really. Oh, you're going down. We're going down the hole, baby. Okay. <laughs> Okay. okay. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So, so if I'm Doug Schoeninger right now, I think he just wants to try and recoup some of his loss. I mean, you know, he's, he's very proud of the fact he's the first person to put three, four, five million dollars into, into rugby in the United States. You know, that, that doesn't impress me. I mean, you know, uh, apparently he came to the union and said, I have $30 million. So by my math, he's got 25, 26 million more to pay people that he's not, that he's actively not, paying people and he's making you know just the 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 issue with Mills Muliana right uh talking to uh rugby newspapers in New Zealand about American rugby and just how backwards this whole pro experience was that just should be a national embarrassment for us it really should it should be a national embarrassment and it was caused directly by the complacency and lack of lack of care of our board of directors and Nigel Melville no question all right uh, but you're not. You got to do the Dan Payne side of this now. Well, if I'm Payne, I mean, you know, I, I think I'm thinking I got to do everything to 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 make sure that that our union doesn't get sued. And he's, you know, he's inherited a mess here, big time. And you know, let's talk about that mess. He has inherited a mess. I think he would absolutely define that as such. And who's responsible for that mess? Like, why are the people that are responsible for that mess still just able to go on doing what they're doing? All and right, let's talk about that real, real briefly. Sir. Congress. Yes. Congress has the ability to pick the board of directors or influence who is on the board of directors. And then That's there's correct. a committee of board members that then approve the well, there's, a no, there's a nominating committee. So, so the Congress picks the chairman of the nominating committee, and then the board of directors picks uh, three or four, three to five people to uh, to to participate in the in the board nomination process. The Congress consists of 46 people, and there's no designated leader of Congress, and that's one of the problems. There is a there is a a, a, a designated representative of Congress to the board. Uh, that that role is is currently uh, filled by Jeremiah Johnson, um, not Robert but, Redford's but he, character in the movie. Right, right. but he does not. He does not. Uh, he's not the leader of the Congress. So there's no one single person that would stand up and say, you know, we need to look at these board of directors. We need to do a hyper audit of the individual comp uh, contribution of these board members. Uh, what have they done? What are they working on? What decisions have they made? The the attendance. Uh, everything because quite frankly and I, again i'm only talking about the results the results from our board have been the creation of pro, you know the sanctioning of pro rugby with supporting nigel melville and also create the creation of rim which is questionable at best in terms of its legality conflicts of interest a lot of questions not answered uh in talking to some of the investors in rim i talked to one of the board members of the harlequins uh, I talked to another investor of RIM just this morning, as a matter of fact, um, and uh, and they told me pretty much they really don't know what they're getting into, but but this looked like the best vehicle to put a toe in the water in rugby in America. Fair enough. That's an expensive I mean, I I, toe, isn't it? I wish I, I wish I had yeah. that kind of money to put yeah. in the toe, but I'm sure the Harlequins and the England Rugby and CSM have that kind of money, no question. Um, it's interesting because they see the value. Um, we, I think we all see the value. Well, they're we just rolling the, the dice. 
I think they're, you know, they're probably rolling the dice. I don't think there's any, you know, there's no guarantee. There's no, there, there's no nothing. I know there's a kind of a convoluted way that people are going to get paid out over time. I think that's in a, in a very long period of time. Uh, of course, RIM's, one of RIM's major fundraising uh, avenues is the rugby channel, which is an interesting concept. Um, but again, in talking to one of the board members about the rugby channel, he said, he said, you know, we didn't know that, that obtaining content would be this difficult. I'm just kind of scratching my head thinking, you know, these are not world-class players we have in these positions and we need to get some and we need to do it now because the time is right. Uh, and let's not forget, if you're looking at the men's men's rugby in the United States, we've lost 11 straight World Cup games. I mean, let's not take our eye off the ball. The fact that, you know, winning, winning is what creates growth. Winning is what creates community and culture. And we haven't won. And, and I, I, I'm, I think I'm eagle number 169 or 269. And, and now Wait, you had, don't know what number you are. I, I don't. I, I Come will. On, I will. Man, I, what's I, I wrong will. with you? Well, they just came out with the list, Matt. Come on. But I know oh, that we just God had number five hundred. I know Martin ISFO is number five hundred, and that, and that, what a milestone! It's great. But I can almost guarantee you that all five hundred of those players have the same feeling that I do: is that we need to do whatever we can to create some winning because the the world's condescension to USA Rugby is just it's not tolerable for me anymore. I mean, they're there was just some gasket that got blown a year and a half ago at the at the at the South Africa match that I just said, I care about this. I hated being thrown to the Lions, being undertrained, undercoached, you know, undernourished, uh, yeah. underloved, uh, underloved yeah. and overserved. You know, I just hated going. You know, I loved going out there, but looking back, I do have regret, and I'd love to be able to for the next ten years put American teams out on the field that have that 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 come from world class resources from the board all the way down to to the youth and 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 again my goal my single goal out of this whole deal Matt I'd like to see the United States play in a rugby world cup quarterfinal game because that that's the game that counts not you know we're playing against South Africa and they're resting their starters you know that's that's not what it's about it's about let's play. Let's get to the that, point that where we're the playing. That is the beast in the Rugby World Cup, though. You know, you'll you'll have coaches. Absolutely, no question. Well, you know. So let's get to the quarterfinal and play a real game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and uh, that's one of the you know it's why I was so disappointed last World Cup cycle because Nigel was talking about two wins. Right. We you know we weren't even close. And uh, I wanted to know. Fact, I wanted to know what one of those four teams in that pool i was the media manager for team usa during the rugby oh, world right. cup and i had the, the the pleasure of having to bring eight players to be available for interviews after the loss to south africa that was a lot of, right. that's a lot of fun right. walking through right. the locker room hey guys hey so you were there at the olympic stadium yeah, yeah. you were there yeah. at the olympic stadium nice nice yeah yep. and uh what was interesting about that and this is this is just a statement uh of fact is i had the um, TV station, the TV people wanted to talk to, to Nigel live at halftime. Right. He didn't get there until half, halfway through the second half. Right, right. CEO. Right, right. Yeah. I, I, well, I, was just, and I was doing a, doing a soft shoe, like, where the hell is it? Right. And I'm looking up in the booth, I'm looking in the suites, and I'm not there. And uh, right. that, that, that's one thing that just, that I thought was, it, it wasn't cool, you know, anyway, but um, I want to just finish this on Congress. Congress yes, is comprised of 46 people. Yep. How does one become a, a member of Congress? Well, you could become a member of Congress like like uh, there's col there's uh, there's representatives from college. There's representatives from high school. There's representatives from club. Uh, there's representatives from international athletes. And uh, there how does Matt McCarthy become a member of Congress? Well, there I think there are three. And you have to get closer to the camera again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, th I think there are three uh, um, three Congress seats open right now. I think there's a the the college um, Northeast College seat is open. Uh, so for me, I'm not 100% positive of that. I'm sure you can go on USA Rugby's website and find out. Um, uh, uh, but the problem that I have with the Congress is we've got 46 people with no leader. This is the only group that can. And, and section 5.7 of the bylaws states very clearly uh, that the that the 
uh, Congress can remove. Do, the I, have, do I have to fact check that? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the board, the Congress can remove the entire board of directors. Uh, there needs to be a petition of 25% of the Congress signed. So we would need, you know, 10 or 11 people, 12 people to sign that. And then you would need a two thirds vote to remove a board of director. And I, th you know, I'm, I'm going to write a letter to the Congress and I believe from the bottom of my heart as, as a business person and a rugby person, we can do better at the board level. We can have visionaries, we can have passion, we can have people that understand world-class organizations and world-class communication. Uh, and I believe we can do that. I don't believe we're gonna do that with the current mix. And again, it's nothing personal against that group. It's just, what have you done? What are the results? And I don't think we can show positive results. So what are you going to do? <laughs> Well, um, you know, I, I'd like to serve on the board. There's no question. I, I, I would like to serve on the board. I think I have I have value that I can add from the rugby perspective, the business perspective. But also, there's you know, there's a. Well, there's real no way you're going to get past the nominating committee now. Right. I, well, you know, maybe not. But uh, uh, but you know, again, there's no media. Someone's got to say what I'm saying. Someone that that know you know that that has the experience that I have needs to say what I'm saying or we will not be performing at a world-class level as an organization. Uh, and I believe, I believe it affects our performance at every level, including the national team. People ask me like, why does this matter? Uh, you know, why, why is this important? And the reason why it's important is, let's say you're a parent of a, of a, of a 14 year old right now. And your kid loves playing rugby and he's pretty good and you're 14 and you're a parent, you don't know that much about rugby, uh, I can guarantee you, if you're that parent, you're listening to this podcast, you're participating in youth rugby, 10 years from now, if your son or daughter is any good at all, they're going to want USA Rugby performing at the, the max level we can. We're going to want, I want to put players that are going to win and, 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 and have these 14-year-olds look to the future, look to play for the Eagles. That's their goal. Um, that becomes their goal. The parents of those players, if you don't think what I'm talking about is important now, uh, you know, we're just not, we, we won't have any money to, uh, if we continue going the way we are right now, where's the money going to come from? Right. Uh, I think our board has shown a, uh, a, a serious inability to raise money. I asked that board member at his house the other day, you know, talk to him about spot. This is before rim talked about sponsorship and fundraising and things like that. I asked, do you have a deck? Do you have a, a list of A, B, and C type prospects? And his response to me was, TR, actually, I don't know. I can't tell you that. We leave that all to Nigel asked us to leave that all to him. So, so that's word for word, word for word. And, and so hearing that disturbed me. But now that I put it in perspective, I see how we're in the situation we are in. Right. We did leave it to Nigel. And here we are, the pro rugby sanctioning and rim. And um, uh, it's just all in the results, really. We just haven't seen the results. And we we need this Congress to 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 audit each board member uh, for their value, for their commitment, for their input uh, and to make sure we have the best players. Uh, I, I'd like to make make another you know statement. We, we Bob Latham uh, left the chairman of the board position after 22 years, which is a tremendous amount of service. And thank you, Bob. But, and now he is USA Rugby's rep to the world. Well, he wasn't, he wasn't chairman Congress. of the board for 22 years. He was a member. No, of the he board was not. For 22 no, no. Years. But, but he, but he's now, Kevin he's Roberts, now, Kevin Roberts preceded correct, him. Correct. But he's now the, the appointed, and I don't know by who the, uh, the representative to world rugby. Um, we have better people that can could represent us at world world rugby than bob i mean it's, bob's a great guy but i'm going to take a guy like dan lyle or ed burlingham uh several others that could provide exponentially more value in terms of not just showing up and having a beer but in terms of creating deals at the world rugby level for, for the united states to participate in and uh i just think we you know we just need to take a wholesale look at the personnel involved take us out of what was the amateur era and into the real professional era, you know, into USA Rugby's professional era. 
And then, you know, so I use the analogy of about, ten, you know, 10 years from now, how that 14 year old is going to want to play for the national team or that four, that 14 year old 10 years from now is going to be a business executive. And he just wants to play some solid club rugby. Our club rugby in the United States has been completely abandoned by the union for the last 20 years. And I think we all can agree the men's and the women's women's is an absolute shambles because you've got four or five different competitions and there's really no pinnacle of championship, which means that we lose out on players playing at the top level on a consistent basis all the time. And in college, you have two 15s championships and two sevens championships okay. because of. Yeah. So, you know, I just hope that Payne can get his arm around that. What I, you know, and, and, and create some fluid pathways. And, and my proposal is this, we're going to need a very strong rugby educated board to be able to put, help push that through. All right. Well, I don't know if the, off the top of your head, do you recall if Paul Emmerich is still on the Congress? I believe, I believe Paul is, I talked to someone yesterday. They, 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 they'd like to see a guy like Paul or, uh, or Blaine Scully be that international athlete rep, which I think would be a great call. Well, and just for the Congress, I think uh, my vote would be Paul Emmerich to be the, the speaker of that Congress or whatever it is, and, because Blaine's over in Wales. Yes, that's so, true. That's true. All right. Final 30 seconds, final yes, comment sir. for you, Tony. Well, thank you for your time. You know, what, 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 what I, you know, this is controversial, right? I mean, here I am on video, and who knows how many people will see this, you know. Well, you've implicated calling, a board member and. In, uh, calling for a you know calling for a monstrous change and and this is this is what I see and and if this is my role to be sort of the 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 account of, you know hold hold our board to account in some way and get some get some traction behind that uh, that's great I'm all for the United States I'm all for winning I'm all for the Eagles both women's men's at every level um, and I think it's important you know the people say well you know who cares about you know why do we should we care about the Eagles the reason we should care about the Eagles is because if you look at, you know, the 1996 women's national soccer team, right, or the 98 men's soccer team, you know, winning is winning. The 1980 and, and Olympic and hockey team. 19, winning is what brings people to the sport as well as just the organic growth. Showing, getting, getting us ourselves out on TV, getting the game out in front of people, getting the popularity. It's exactly what the NFL told World Rugby is we just try and get it televised everywhere we can. And if people enjoy the game, watching the game, the NFL guy said they will figure out how to play it. And, I'm, and it's got to be easier to figure out how to play rugby than it does American football because you don't need any pads. So, uh, um, And you get to uh, rest. It's an, it's an exciting, very exciting time. Uh, we, we, need to, we just need to take an honest, transparent look at all of our levels. All right. Well, Tony – uh, much appreciated. I, at, at the very least, it's pretty cool that uh, the kid from the uh, from the Bronx or Bronxville, which is now the new Greenwich, Connecticut, by the way, yes. Bronxville, exactly. and not exactly the same thing when you when you were there. And a kid from Jersey City, New Jersey, can be talking rugby on this level. It's wonderful. It's pretty cool. It's wonderful. It is absolutely cool. wonderful. And Matt, thanks for doing what you're doing on the media side. You know, we, we need this, and uh, and and just be vigilant, man. C call people to account. We need it. All right. Well, when I grow up, I want to be a rugby mainstream media guy. So that you can. <laughs> you all right. I didn't mean that. Slight, no, it's please. all right. I'm the youngest of four boys, guy. I have a thick skin. Right. Thank you, man. All right, Appreciate buddy. Time. Take it Good easy. Man. Cheers. And that was Mr. Tony Ridnell. Uh, he of USA Rugby Eagle uh, heritage lineage, I should say. He's had 14 caps, as he said, and uh, played in about 50 matches. Uh, large man and uh, uh, certainly a large character, and we enjoyed having him on. Hope you enjoyed it too, uh, and we hope that you uh, were able to bear with our technical glitches. I know that Tony looked like he was on fire at some times, completely blurred out in a witness protection program at others, and maybe morphing into some other being at other times. But I think you can listen and uh, you can download it, and uh, there you have it. Rugby wrap-up, Matt McCarthy. Signing off on our first ever YouTube Live, Google Hangouts, podcast slash webcast slash phone call. Thanks for listening. And thanks for listening.